أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم للفقراء المهاجرين الذين أخرجوا من ديارهم وأموالهم يبتغون فضلا من الله ورضوانا وينصرون الله ورسوله أولئك هم الصادقون والذين تبوأوا الدار والإيمان من قبلهم يحبون من هاجر إليهم ولا يجدون في صدورهم حاجة مما أوتوا ويؤثرون على أنفسهم ولو كان بهم خصاصة ومن يوق شح نفسه فأولئك هم المفلحون والذين جاءوا من بعدهم يقولون ربنا اغفر لنا ولإخواننا الذين سبقونا بالإيمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف رحيم صدق الله العظيم These ayahs are continuation of the same topic that we started talking about from the beginning of Surah Al-Hashab. And today I recited three ayahs, ayah number 8, 9, and 10. Although when we initially talked about the background of the surah, we covered all of these things and the basic message of the surah was covered of the, at the time. But now, of course, we are going into the further detail of these verses, of these ayahs, and the additional points that are mentioned in these ayahs. Just to refresh our memory, the surah is revealed about a clan called Ban Nadir who had made a treaty with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when they brought the treaty, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked them to leave Medina Munawwara, they refused. Some of the munafiqeen said to them, we will help you, don't, you don't have to leave. And they came their mind, they did not leave. And finally, they were forced to leave, as we talked about it in detail uh, in our previous sessions. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about these plans of Jews that were living in Medina Munawwara, and especially in this surah talked about Banu Nadir leaving Medina Munawwara, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned or talked about the rules of the wealth, the booty that was taken from them or things that they left behind them in Medina Munawwara. And I mentioned at the time that there are two different types of Buris, according to the laws of the Sharia, one is called Ghanima and the other is called Faith. And in our previous session, we talked about the difference between Ghanima and Faith. Faith is the one that you get it without any war or after little confrontation, but then they surrender and give up. And Ghanima is the one that is taken after a war. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he mentioned, who deserves the faith, to whom the faith will be given. As we said, faith will not be given to the warriors because there was no war. The faith will not be given to those who went with the intention of war, or those who had a little confrontation, but then the enemy surrendered, surrendered and they gave up. So it will not be given to those people. So then the question comes, who would take the faith? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned six 
categories of pray. The first was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself, and as I mentioned at that time in the previous session, the reason of mentioning Allah's name is only to tell us that it's pure wealth and anyone can use it is not like zakah where people uh, it's considered to be the dirt of the wealth that is taken out and at the same time the other reason for mentioning Allah's name is to tell people that this is something that will be uh, given on the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the rest of the five categories will take it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give it to them. So basically it goes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The rule in the previous ummahs and the previous nations was that these sadaqat and anything that is taken as duri, whether ghanima or faith, they were not allowed to use it. A fire would come and burn it down. And that was the sign that these things are accepted from the believers. So, people were not allowed to use that at all. In our Sharia, we are allowed to use it, and this is why Allah says, it's for me. At that time, I ordered for it to be burned down, and now I order that give it to the rest of these five categories on my behalf. And then, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the rest of the five categories. The first two out of five were, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his relatives. And those two, after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, are gone now. The reason the relatives won't get it, I mentioned in the previous session, that because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to give it to them because he was responsible for them, but after his death, now he is not responsible anymore, so he won't have to give it to them anymore. Then, Three categories are only left out of six. Wal yatama wal masakin wa mistabin. Orphans, poor people, and travelers. Now, out of these three categories, these three categories are still there. Yatama, masakin, wa mistabin. Out of these three categories, who are the most deserving people? Because now we have three categories. In each category, there might be a lot of people, a lot of orphans, a lot of people in need of it. Mataki, needy people, a lot of people in need of it. Wabnissabeen, a lot of travelers. So who would have the priority of taking this wealth or for us to give them that wealth? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now in these three ayahs is talking about those categories of people who deserve it the most. Before I go into the ayahs, i just like to mention a few more things about these categories and these ayahs. These categories that are mentioned, there are basically three categories that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in these ayahs. Each ayah is talking about one of these categories. The first two ayahs are about Sahaba Rizwanullahi and of course, it's a general rule, at that time it was apply, applicable to only Sahaba Rizwanullah Majma'een and after them whoever will have these qualities, the same qualities for which Sahaba Rizwanullah Majma'een deserved that faith, that booty. The first is Muhajireen, the second category is Ansar, and the third category is people who came after Sahaba Rizwanullah Majma'een including all of us as ummah that will come till the day of judgment. Three categories that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mentioned who deserve it the most if they fall under one of those three categories Yatama, Masakim, Ibn Sabil. Now, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that these people deserve it the most Fuqara, Muhajireen Ansar, and the Muslims that will come later on in Ummah with certain qualities. And he mentioned those qualities. Now this ayah, as it talks about who would be given the booty, at the same time it tells us who are the most deserving people for sadaqat, for charity, because as now there was a question about booty, who are the, there are categories, but who are the most deserving people? 
Same thing, we all find ourselves in a position sometimes that you want to do something good. And you want to help an organization, a masjid, Islamic cause. But now there are so many of them that you don't know which one to help and which one to reject. And the reason of rejecting is not because you don't like to help. Yes, there might be some of those too, but majority of them, we will say, okay, they are all good causes. I don't know which one to help the most. And how to define the people who are the most deserving of it. If you talk to the people who are running those organizations, each of them will, by talking to each of them, you will feel that this is the most deserving people. These are the most deserving people, or this is the most deserving masjid or organization. So where, how to determine who would be the most deserving people in that case? These ayahs will teach us that lesson also, which is something that a lot of time we really need it. For example, I tell you my experience sometimes we travel. And I have to travel a lot and during these journeys, you see a lot of masadis. If not a lot, even if you think of putting, you have one dollar. You will have one dollar that you can spend. And there are so many masadis that you're willing. Now you don't know which of these masadis should you give this dollar to? Regardless of what the amount is. This is why I'm giving the example of a dog. That I don't know to whom should I give that dog. Should I mean go and get a change of it? Get hundred pennies in my hand? And then keep on putting five cents in each musket? Or should I have then 50-50 to two massages? Or should I put this one dollar at one place? Sometimes it might become a difficult question for us, and these ayahs at least will give us some rules about how to determine. So inshallah, let's go through the ayahs, then inshallah we will know these rules of giving the sadaqat and the most deserving people for these sadaqat. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِلْفُقَرَاءِ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ That duty that will be given out, it should be given to the poor immigrants. Sahaba Ridwanullah Ali Mahmain who immigrated from Makkah Mukarama to Madina Munawara. Alladina Ufridu min diarihim wa amwalihim who were expelled from their homes and their properties. Yaptawuna Fadla min Allahi wa Ridwana seeking Allah's bounties and his pleasure. وَيَنْصُرُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ And they help Allah and His Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الصَّادِقُونَ Surely they are the truthful people. This is the first category. فُقَرَاءِ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ The poor immigrants who left their homes in fact they were expelled from their homes from their towns and they had to leave their wealth and everything behind them. And they left only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to have the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about them, أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الصَّادِقُونَ I will come back to these ayahs. Let's go through the all three ayahs, then we'll come back to them inshallah. The second ayah. Now this ayah talks about Ansar, the second category of people. وَالَّذِينَ تَبَوَّأُوا الدَّارَ وَالْإِيمَانَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ And those who had their homes and had adopted Iman before these immigrants. Those who had their homes in Medina Munawwara, which means the father, who had their homes in Medina Munawwara. وَالْإِيمَان And they had adopted Iman and faith before these people immigrated to Medina Munawwara. يُحِبُّونَ مَنْ هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِمْ They love those who immigrate to them. They love the ones that are coming to them. وَلَا يَجِدُونَ فِي صُدُورِهِمْ حَاجَةً مِمَّا أُوتُوا And they have no hard feelings in their hearts for what these immigrants are given. If these muhajirin are given wealth by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or anything else, these Ansar have no hard feelings against that. And not only that, 
ويؤثرون على أنفسهم ولو كان بهم خطاطة and they give others preference over themselves even though if they were in need ومن يوقع شح نفسه فأولئك هم المفلحون whosoever is saved from his own greed they are the successful ones this was the second category the first category and now this category is very important because generally it will talk about us وَالَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ and those who came after them with what with certain qualities what are those qualities يقولون they say رَبَّنَا اخْفِرْ لَنَا وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا الَّذِينَ شَبَقُونَا بِالْإِيمَانِ يَا اللَّهُ forgive us and those of our brothers who proceeded us in faith who were believers before us وَلَا تَجْعَلْ فِي قُلُوبِنَا غِلًّا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا and do not put in our hearts any hatred against those who have believed before us رَبَّنَا إِنَّكَ رَؤُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ Our Lord, surely you are kind, merciful. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned these three ayahs as the main categories of people who deserve sadaqah, charities, booty, the most. The first category Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned is muhajireen. Let's go through the ayahs word by word to understand what are the qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala liked about muhajireen. The ayah talks about the importance of those muhajireen and the virtue of those muhajireen, but at the same time will tell us the qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala liked in them so that whenever a similar situation will arise for the ummah, those who would have the same qualities will be of the highest levels of believers of that time, which means will be the people who would deserve the most help from the ummah and will be considered the highest level of ummah. First thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about them, fuqara, the poor people. These muhajireen when they were in Makkah Mukarramah, they were very wealthy. And most of them were some of the wealthiest people in Makkah Mukarramah had great business in Makkah Mukarramah. When these people left Makkah Mukarramah, the kuffar of Quraysh took over all of their wealth, their homes, their businesses, everything. And they left their homes only with only the only dress that they had on them. Nothing else. So imagine a person who have established himself in the last 20, 30 years with everything established in his own hometown, with his business, he has his own house, he has everything, every comfort of the life. He's not missing anything out of that. All of a sudden, overnight, that person by choice, not by force, by choice, gives up all of that and is left with nothing except the clothes that he has on. What type of sacrifice that is? That is? And who can even think of doing something like that to him as, or to herself? This is what those muhajireen do to themselves. This is exactly what they have done to, for themselves. That everything that they had in Makkah Mukarramah they left it behind and it was just like giving it to their enemies and walking empty handed out of Makkah Mukarramah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala admires them for that although nowadays when it comes to us we like to use wisdom a lot and we will say, oh, it's against the wisdom to give them all of your wealth and just leave and run away. It's not wise to do this. Oh, they will benefit from your wealth. They are going to take advantage of your wealth. They are the winners of skill because they got so much of, the, of your wealth. Allah says, no. When you have to do something, you have to do it. Allah will give you and will give you more. Now don't try to be too wise at this time. As our hikmah works only 
when we like to get things in our favor. Most of the time when shaitan uses the word hikmah through our mouth and through our tongue is really only using it for not fulfilling the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the time of committing sins, the person will use the word hikmah. You know, you have to use wisdom. If you don't do this type of mixed gatherings, you don't do these haram, then, you know, people won't come. Use your hikmah, use your wisdom, let people come in. And with every haram, this is how shaitan comes and approaches us. That, do the haram because it's wisdom. And after the person does the haram, he considers himself one of the wisest people in the world because through his wisdom of committing the sin, he was able to attract so many people. So that was a wisdom. And, generally we find ourselves that we use our wisdom or the word wisdom for these type of things. There are so many words that are unfortunately are so badly misused nowadays that the real meaning of those words are not in existence anymore and these words became as some bad words. And we need to really take the dictionary to put it according to our present time and the use of the present time because these words are not used for what they were used in the past and for the meanings that is mentioned of them in the dictionaries. One of them is this hikmah, wisdom, where in our masjid it comes only when we want to do something haram, something against the sharia, something against the sunnah, then we will say it's wisdom to do this. It's wise to do it, so use our wisdom. Similarly, the word research. When you want to deny the facts and truth, use the word research. That I did the research, and according to my research, this is not true. And, that's it. Your research, regardless of who the person is, what, what his background is, and what is he doing the research on, God forbid people would do research on Allah, people would do research on the prophets of Allah, people would do research on the knowledge of the prophet of Allah, and they would do research on anything, and on the name of research, you can deny any truth in the world. I can remember a list of those words at this time that is going through my mind. But, I don't want to take too much time or spend too much time on that, on the side topic, it's only for us to understand that how the meaning of the words sometimes change, and we are not able to understand the right meaning for it anymore. In the old books, you find Islamic politics. Now the word politics, it's so, it's used for us. Totally different meanings. And this is why sometimes, you find a person saying, politics is part of Islam. And another person gets so upset, he says, politics has nothing to do with Islam. Why? They are both on the same page, but if only one is using the old dictionary, the other one is using the new dictionary. And in the new dictionary of politics, lying, cheating, false promises, oh, this is all refers to politics. Fundamentalism. All dictionary and new dictionary, there are two different meanings. So, there are so many words like that that are totally misused. I was saying these muhajireen, when they left their world, there are many people in Medina Munawwara who are called munafiqeen. They called it against the wisdom. This is why they used to use the word safi for these Sahaba Ridwanullahi If you read the beginning ayahs of Surah Al-Baqarah, أَنُؤْمِنُ كَمَا آمَنَ السُّفَهَا Safi means a person who doesn't know what he's doing. Just like we see, we, for us, hikmah and the opposite of hikmah would be safi, in other words. 
So they used to call these muhajireen, safi, anu'minu kama amana sukaha, munafiqeen used to say, should our iman be like the iman of these insane people, people who have no brain, don't know what they are doing, they left all of their wealth to the kuffar to use them? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says no. The claim that you are calling it wisdom, ala innahum humus sukaha, they are the insane people. They don't know what they are doing. Because these muhajireen gave the wealth away and took iman. And these people keeping the wealth and giving away the iman. Anyway, the word fuqara is used for these sahaba ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een. Faqir means a person who doesn't have wealth. And this leads to a very important ruling of the Sharia, and that is in a situation when kuffar take away the wealth of a Muslim, that wealth became theirs, it does not belong to this Muslim anymore. Which means after 10 years, 20 years, if he finds it somewhere, he cannot claim it. At the same time, it's in his own advantage that he does not have to keep on paying the zakah of that wealth throughout his life. And it so happens that a Muslim finds someone selling it, he's allowed to buy it because it's their wealth now and they can sell it too. If he buys it and brings it to this person, this person in Islamic court cannot claim that this is mine because they took it from me by force because now it wasn't his anymore. As the other person bought it, it became his, <laughs> and now if this person wants it back, he has to buy it. So that's, this is why Allah calls them fuqara. Although they had all the wealth in Makkah Mukarramah, but as it was taken away from them, Allah says, now they are not agniya anymore. They are not wealthy anymore, now they are fuqara, they are poor people. Which means that wealth is not theirs anymore. Al-Muhajirin, Lil-Fuqara Al-Muhajirin, Hijra we know means immigration, leaving one place for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a place where a person is not able to practice the deen of Allah, in order to protect our deen, our faith, our iman, our practices of the deen, going from one place to another place. Now that Hijra could be from one country to another country, from one town to another town, from one place to another place. Anything but the condition is for the sake of Allah to become a better Muslim. To be able to keep our iman, to protect our iman, that is of course, and that, in that situation, hijrah will be false. If at one place iman is not protected and is in danger, then hijrah from that place to another place where we will be able to save our iman is false. But hijrah to become better Muslims, going at another place in order to be better practicing Muslims, that hijra is good, mustahab, sunnah, and anyone who would do it will get the reward for that hijra of leaving that place for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says these poor immigrants who were expelled from their homes and their properties, now, look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. They were expelled from their homes and their properties. Normally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Quran al kareem again and again uses the word, My wealth. وَأَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقْنَاكُمْ Spend out of what we have given you. وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ They spend out of what we have given them. Here he says, مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ وَأَمْوَالِهِمْ From their homes and their properties. To tell us that although it's not yours, but as I have given it to you, and you leave it for my sake, Allah appreciates that so much. That He says that since you left it for my sake, I consider that you gave away your thing for my sake. I won't say that you gave my thing for my sake. By giving up anything for the sake of Allah, giving away a charity, or leaving everything behind, we are not doing Allah any favor. 
we are only helping our own souls because we are protecting our akhirah. But still, Allah's, one of Allah's attributes is ash-shakur. What does ash-shakur mean? Shakur means the one who appreciates things from others. You do small things, and he appreciates that so much as if you have done so much for him. This is Allah ash-shakur. And it's a quality that Allah likes to see in human beings also. That when we people do something for us, we should appreciate that. We should not try to find fault in it. We should not try to find the mistakes in those things. We should try to appreciate that as much as we can and try to make the person feel that he has done more than what he really has done. This is what the quality of ash-shakur means. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran, وَقَلِيلٌ مِّنْ عِبَادِيَ الشَّكُورٌ very few of my slaves and my servants are those who have this quality of being ash-shakur, of being grateful. A lot of people are not grateful. In fact, if you remember the hadith where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam talked about large number of women being in the hellfire and they asked, Ya Rasulullah, what is the reason for that? This was one of the reasons that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that many of them have this quality of, um, don't have the quality of being grateful and therefore if the husband will keep on doing everything throughout the life and one day he would do something wrong, the word he would have to hear from them is that, oh, I have never seen anything good in your life. Throughout my life I haven't, I haven't seen anything good from you. So this is again being ash-shakur. And this was one of the reasons mentioned by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a reason for going into the hellfire. So in other words, to protect ourselves from going in that way uh, towards the hellfire, we have to be ash-shakur, we have to be grateful. And we have to learn how to be grateful. I'll give you a simple example of it. Although, there can be very major examples and we always see people doing so much for us at the end of the day. The person says, I can do this for you. He rejects doing one thing. That's it. No more relationship with this person anymore. And this person became the worst person in the world. He was going out of his way all the time. He's helping us in every situation with all the things. Today he said, you know, with this thing, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm busy, I cannot do it. Or, uh, I'm, for some other reason, I'm not able to do it that much. Now, this, is not a, this person is not good anymore. And we forget all the favors that we have got from this person throughout our lives. Sometime a person might give us a gift. And he might even tell us, or we know it. He got hundred bottles of perfume from somewhere. He doesn't know what to do with them. He has to give it out. So he gives me one of those. So as I take it, I know, you know, I know he has to give it out. He has to throw it out anyway. It won't last for too long. There is something that won't last for too long. So he has to give it out anyway. He didn't know what to do with it. So he gave it to me. So now, I'm trying to find a reason for not being grateful to the person. Why don't I think this way, that doesn't he have hundred more people in the world that he can give it to? There are thousands of people in the world, he can go and give it to someone else. For him to think about me, that, okay, let me give it to him, that by soul needs some strength and needs some appreciation that, okay, I appreciate that you thought about me. Otherwise, I'm, I'm sure you know hundred more people. You could have given, given it to those people. You could have thrown it away in the garbage. Thinking about me, that it by itself, shows that there is some love in the person's heart for me. So, this, and unfortunately, something that we suffer the most from this, that not having this quality of being grateful. And, truly speaking, I have seen so many of these examples. So many of these examples. And the least of it will be children saying to their parents, 
I don't care about what you have to say. I don't care about what you have to do. I'm not getting all of this from you. And I don't depend on you. After they were raised by these terms. And in the worldly sense speaking, terms were everything for the child. That is everything for the child. After growing up, he behaves or she behaves as we have nothing to do with these people. So, here we can realize when people become ungrateful, to what extent they can be ungrateful, and of course, worse than that is being ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one who is blessing us and blessing us and blessing us, and day and night we are just receiving and receiving, and when it comes for him, he says, could you perform two rakah for me? He says, I don't have the time. I'm a little busy right now. Could you get up and do this for my deen? I cannot do it. Could you give this for my deen? My deen at this time is in need of this. Could you do it for my deen? I cannot do it. If a person gives us his car, he says, okay, you keep the car for one month. All I need from you is, if you just go in, because normally we use this car for my children to drop them off to the school, so all I do need from you is, if you just drop my children to the school and bring them back at the end of the day, and you keep the car for you, for you use free of charge, and you don't have to worry about anything. How grateful we would be to that person. We'll say, oh, not only your children, I can even drop you anywhere you want. Anytime you need my help, let me know. And I'm at your service, and we will do anything for that person. <coughs> Just use of a car for one month, for one week, for one day, will make us so grateful to these people. And we are grateful to those who help us in these situations. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, day and night, is favoring us with so many of His favors and blessings. And we keep on re- receiving it and taking it and taking it. And when it comes for him that he needs something and he sees it, he doesn't, of course, he's not in need, but he wants to see what we would do for him. Here, spend this, there is a need. All of a sudden, you end up at a place where you find that really Iman is in need, Deen is in need. And right away we say, no, at this time, I can't do it. I can't give right to your children. You give me the car for a month, yes, you call the person back, sorry, I cannot give the right. So what if the person says, give me the car back? What if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he says in Quran, قُلْ أَرَأَيْتُ مِنْ أَخَذَ اللَّهُ سَمْعَكُمْ وَأَبْصَارَكُمْ وَخَتَمَ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِكُمْ مَنْ إِلَاهٌ غَيْرُ اللَّهِ يَأْتِيكُمْ بِهِ He's saying, forget about everything else. Just tell me this, what if I take the power of hearing from you and power of seeing? That's it. I take these two things that you cannot... Do what I'm asking you to do. Okay, give me these two things back. So you can't hear anymore, you can't see anymore. What the person would do after that? Would he still say, no, I have no time? Now he would do anything to get his eyesight back if he knows and we believe that Allah is the one who has given us this. That's that. The person will be denied trying to please Allah. Please, the Allah, don't take it away from me. And it's not that he's taking it away. He's not that, it's not that he's punishing us or punishing us by taking, but he's reminding us that say, if I take it away from you, what is it that you would do then? But still, again the day after all of these ayahs, when the need comes for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we find it difficult to do anything for the sake of Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about Ansar. No, about Muhajirin, we were talking about Muhajirin. Ukhriju min diyarihim wa amwalihim. They were expelled from their homes and their properties, and I was saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they did not do favor to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but Allah appreciates these things. And He's rewarding us for these things. If He won't reward us, really nothing we can demand from Him. He can tell us as my servants for all the nama that I have given you. If you want to keep your eyes, you pray five times a day. And to keep your eyes, uh, your hearing, you fast every day. 
to keep the power of his feet, you do zikr these many times every day? Who is it that won't do it? If we will have to pay for it, we will pay for it for sure. We don't get, get free gas for our cars. We have to pay for that gas every day, every time we buy the gas. What if Allah would tell us for this body, now how you have to keep on paying, pay the bill of seeing things. And the bill is, you have to pray these many times. Pay the bill of you using your hearing. And the bill is, that you have to fast these many days of the year. Pay the bill of speaking. And the bill is, that you have to do the zikr of Allah these many times every day. Each and every person will do it. And we will have to do it, we will be forced to do it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not force us. So, if he really wants, he can tell us that these ibadahs are for these blessings. blessings. And you don't, you are not getting any more reward for doing the ibadahs, you are not doing me a favor. I'm not going to give you no reward. It's only you are paying for what you're using. It's still, it was obligatory on us to do all of that. But subhanAllah, it's his rahmah, it's his blessing. That he's saying, okay, you don't pay me for all of this. مَا أُرِيدُ مِنْهُمْ مِنْ رِزْقِ I'm not looking for any sustenance from human beings. وَمَا أُرِيدُ أَنْ يُطْعِمُونَ I don't want them to feed me. إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الرَّزَاقِ He says, in fact, I will keep on feeding you. Don't even worry about that part. All I need from you is that you do the ibadah, I will give you the reward. For whatever you do, I will give you the reward. I won't charge you for the blessings that you're using, and I will keep on getting, giving you additional rewards for what you do. SubhanAllah. Isn't this a great rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who are expelled from their homes, their properties, يَبْتَغُونَ فَضْلًا مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرِضْوَانًا They are seeking Allah's bounties and pleasures. What does Fadl and Ridwan mean? In Quran al Karim, the word Fadl normally used for worldly gain. فَإِذَا قُضِيَتِ الصَّلَاةُ On the Salat al Jum'ah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِذَا قُضِيَتِ الصَّلَاةُ فَانْتَشِرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَاتَّغُوا مِنْ فَضْلِ اللَّهِ Seek the bounties of Allah, which means you can go back to work after Salat al Jum'ah. So the word fadl in Qur'an normally is used for worldly gain. And ridwan, rida, which means pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is used for the benefits of akhirah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala admires the muhajireen for this quality, that after giving away everything, these people are not going and begging people. They are not running door to door. They are not depending on people. يَبْتَغُونَ فَضْلًا مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرِضْوَانًا They are seeking bounties and the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which means Allah says, I love this quality whenever they need anything whether of this worldly gain or of something of the akhirah they return, they come back to me, they ask me for it. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us the beautiful du'a رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنًا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنًا وَقِنَا عَذَابِ النَّارِ So even when it comes to dunya, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course then, start doing the work. How many of us, early in the morning before we leave to our work, we spend a minute to say to Allah, Ya Allah, I'm leaving for my work, but you give it to me, you are the provider. And Ya Allah, with your permission, I'm going out to work. Provide me with halal sustenance, halal risk. So I will bring no haram to my home and my family. If we just, every morning, we just think about it for a minute. After Salat al-Fajr, we raise our hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make this dua. We will be of those who are yaftaguna fadlam min Allah, who are seeking the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But unfortunately, what happens is many times we feel that what we are earning is through my work. You know, I have my business, my store is there, my place is there, I have a workplace, and I will go there, work, and get my and get paid for it. That's it. It's as easy as that. Simple. 
What else do I have to do? But we need to realize all of this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If there is barakah in it, we will always have peace of mind through it. If there is no barakah in it, all the peace of mind will be taken away from it. The same wealth, the same business, the same, same factory, the same sources of income that we are normal, that we bring, will get us the peace of mind and we will get everything through that, those will become the cause to take everything away from us. And we see, we see, there are people with everything good, best business, but that business has taken everything away from this person. Now this person doesn't belong to his Lord, doesn't belong to Allah, doesn't belong to Rasulullah, doesn't belong to his family, doesn't belong to his children. Nafsi, nafsi, only myself. I'm not worried about anything else in this life. So, it's important that we seek the bounties of Allah and the mercy of Allah and ask Allah for every need of ours of this dunya and after. وَيَنْصُرُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ And number four, Allah says about these muhajireen, they help Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So look at the qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about and mentioned of these muhajireen. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, اُخْرِجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ وَمْوَالِهِمْ they were expelled from their home, their wealth. So that is hijrah. They left all of that behind. Number two, min Allahi wa ridwana. They are seeking the bounties of Allah and the pleasure of Allah. Number three, wa yansurun Allah wa rasulahu. They help the deen of Allah. They help Allah means they help the deen of Allah and they have the messenger of Allah. Helping Allah means helping the deen of Allah. Helping Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam means establishing the sunnahs of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. These are the qualities that Allah loved in those muhajirin for which he blessed them and he talks about them in Qur'an. He loved them so much for these qualities that he talks about them in Qur'an that in, a, in his book that will be recited till the Day of Judgment, in a book that even those now who would recite these good qualities of Mahajirin, for each and every letter that we would recite, we will get ten rewards. For talking, for reciting these ayahs, of course, that are talking about the virtue of these Mahajirin. Very important qualities <coughs> as Muslims. If we look at improving our deen, our iman, these are some things that we really we need to look into. Especially yaktawuna fadlam min Allahi wa ridwana wa yansurun Allah wa rasulah. Seeking the bounties of Allah and the pleasure of Allah and wa yansurun Allah wa rasulah. Helping Allah, the deen of Allah, and helping Rasulullah, the sunnahs of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah says, whoever has these qualities, ulaikahum usqadiqoon, they are the fruitful people. Now, in the next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about Ansar. وَالَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ Those who came after them. وَالَّذِينَ تَبَوَّعُ الدَّارَ وَالْإِيمَانِ Those who had their homes in Medina Munawwara before these Muhajireen came to Medina. So these are the residents of Medina Munawwara. And they had the Iman, they had established Iman in their homes before the Muhajireen immigrated from Mecca to Medina. Look at this quality. A unique quality. No matter how much we talk about it, I'll say this much, none of us have it. None of us have it. And we can look into our hearts, we will find that yes, we don't have it. It's not a requirement for deen, for iman. So it doesn't mean that we are not Muslims, we are not believers. But it's such a quality, such a unique quality that it's so difficult to have this quality might be one of the most difficult things to adopt in our life if we were to work on this. And what is this? They love the ones who immigrate to them. Not only that, they open their homes for them. Not only that, they share everything with them, they love them. When people start coming to our town, newcomers will come to our town, and they are in a situation as Allah says, فقراء. They are totally poor, they are poor people, have nothing. 
the first thing every person will start talking about it in our in the town will be that we will have a financial crash. Financially, we will be dead. All of these people are coming empty-handed. What? How are we going to survive? And now they will be dependent on us. We will have to fulfill all of their needs. They don't have homes. We have to give them homes. They left their families behind. They will start, start getting married here now. To these poor people, are we going to offer our daughters to these poor people who have no business, no families, nothing, nothing with them? No, of course, impossible. We don't want to do that. And have no business, no wealth, so financially he is going to be dependent on me and I will have to support them. With all of these realities, still loving those people, subhanAllah, the quality that is extremely difficult to have. How can we love? Yes, we might satisfy our souls with our deen and iman and every eye and hadith that okay, you know, you should accept these people. And if not in your own home at least, you can, we can have another house beside our home that we can rent it for these people. That would be too much if we would do something like that. But to keep them in our own home, here, half of the house is mine, half of it is yours. This is the business. You have nothing. Half of the business is yours, half of it is mine now. Who would do that? Who can do that? And who are these people? People that they didn't know at all in the past. They may not even have seen these people in the past of their life. First time, this, they didn't know who this person was. All of a sudden, they hear a new immigrant came to Medina Munawara. These Ansar have so much love for them. They are running to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Rasulullah, please have this person stay with me. I'll share everything that I have with him. And not only this. Because of this love that they had for these muhajireen, they requested Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as I said, something unique, something totally unique. They requested Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, how about we don't want our brothers and sisters to inherit us, we like these people to inherit us. La ilaha illallah. What is all of that? Take a simple example, we come into the masjid, and here a person comes, he says, I took shahada some days back. I have nowhere to go. I'm in difficult, financially in a difficult situation. So, can you help me? Can you talk to someone that I, if I can stay in the masjid? Forget, he's not, forget about staying in our home, he's not even talking about that. And he can't even think about it, and we will make sure that he won't even think about it. And don't even look at my pocket. All of that is mine. But staying in the masjid, because I do perform the salah in this masjid, and because I care in the masjid, I will make sure that I will tell the person in charge about the masjid, that you know this is what the person was saying, but make sure that you don't let him stay. Whatever the reasons might be, you know, I'm not saying good or bad, but... Having that quality of love for these newcomers is not an easy thing to have. That's why I said it from the very beginning. It's a quality that we don't have. Allah is admiring the Ansar, the people of Medina Munawwara, for this quality. And I was thinking, when we talk about going for Hajj, and people after come back from Hajj, they talk against those people, you know, they these. Arabs are like this, these Saudis are like that, those people in Mecca are like this. Imagine if every year, three million people, they go in a town, they use up everything, all the resources of that town. They make all the mess in that town, and they come back. What should be the feeling of those people about us going from here and doing all of that in that town? And then we come back and talk against the very same people. If these people are upset with us, they have all the right to do so because I know it is a fact by living over there for some time that when Fajaj go over there, 
Many times they have shortage of water and what the government do is they close all the public water for the residents because they say we have to provide the Fajr and you people buy the water on the private, from the private company. And they do it. And they're willing to do it. And they don't complain. We don't read those things in our newspapers that those people are complaining, you're for judge, bring your own water next time, we are not going to suffer because of you. Yusaddoona man hajra ilayhim is a special quality to love those who come to us. As I said, very unique qualities. No matter how much we talk about it, it's a high quality that we cannot even get to it by our words. And we can never admire those people for the quality, this quality that they have. But it's something that we really need to look into. And at least have it to a certain extent we need to have it in our hearts. Loving the newcomers, taking care of them in whichever way possible. subhanallah, they were of this, of such a quality that they are saying, Ya Rasulullah, some of them, they offered their businesses to these muhajireen that said, here, take the whole business. Take my home, I have two homes, take half, take one of my houses, and that's yours now. Who has the quality of doing something like this? And not only this, not only that they are sharing it with them, look what Allah says in the next part of the ayah. وَلَا يَجِدُونَ فِي صُدُورِهِمْ حَاجَةً مِمَّا أُوتُوا When Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gets a lot of booty and he gives it to the muhajireen, these Ansar do not even feel bad about that one. Now, try to picture the situation that they came to us, we shared everything with them half and half. We gave them half of our businesses, we gave them half of our homes, we shared everything that we have half and half. After sharing it, there is more money that came and they are given all of that. So now who has more wealth? They have more than we do because we had already shared it half and half. So we both had half and half and as more came, they were the only ones that were given. I didn't get nothing out of it. So I need to get upset about it that, come on now, if I shared everything half and half, then you should at least share these things also and give them half and give us half. But Allah says, their hearts were such, no love for the worldly things. They were not judging iman for this by this worldly gain. They do not have any hard feelings for what these muhajirin are given. And not only that. Even one step beyond that. We could not achieve the first one. Allah is going ahead of that now. And talking about them that this is what they have. The first quality, that Yuhibun, they love the ones that are coming to them. The second one, they one step ahead of that, we failed at the first one. They are still going ahead. The second one is, when I have done a piece of duty, I'm After sharing everything and having all this love for them, now whatever they are given, they don't feel bad about it. Today, if our own brother within the same family is given something more than us, we feel bad about it. And the third step, going even higher in these qualities, Allah says, not only this, their level of morals is so high that they give other preference over themselves even if they are in need of it. They need it, but they realize that my brother needs it. This Muhajir, the person who immigrated, he needs it. He would go and tell him, here, you take it. I don't need it. I'm not going to keep it. It's not mine anymore. It's yours. He has only one right. It happens. That person in Medina has only one right. He has only one horse. If he doesn't have the right, he can't go for long distances. As that Muhajir came, a person, a new immigrant came, he went to him and said, take my horse. That's yours now. So what are you going to do? You take it. Don't worry about me. Subhanallah. 
وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ They give others preference over themselves even they are, even although they are in need of it. And once there was a Sahabi, Abu Talha رضي الله عنه, he says, Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم after Salat al-Isha had a guest. He asked his Sahaba, first thing he sent a person to his family to ask all of his wives if there was any food at home. And the reply from all of these houses was that all we have is just water to drink for our souls. That's it. We don't even have anything to eat for our souls. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked his Sahaba that who can keep this person as my guest? But you keep him with you because I have nothing to feed him. So, one of the Sahaba said, I will take him, Ya Rasulullah. And he took him. He went home and asked his wife, do we have anything to feed this guest? She said, nothing. And nothing for me and you either. The only thing we have, we have little food for our children and you can hear them crying. Our children are crying for food, they are hungry, I am preparing the meal for them. So, we have only for them, nothing for me and you. So he says to his wife, you know, this is the guest of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We can't let him go to sleep hungry like this. Therefore, now, get the children to go to sleep somehow without eating and we will offer all of the food to this guest. So he gives away all the food of his children to his guest. It's easy to give our food. But to give our children food when they are crying for it is not an easy thing to do. وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ They give others preference over themselves even if they are in need of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ يُوْقَ شُحْحَ نَفْسِهِ Whoever sees from his own greed, they are the successful ones. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith which is in Sunan ibn Majah لا يزداد الأمر إلا شدة The situation of Iman will keep on getting worse and worse. وَلَا الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا إِدْبَارَ And the dunya will be running away from people. وَلَا النَّاسُ إِلَّا شُحَا And people will keep on getting greedy and greedier. They will be getting more and more greedy for this worldly thing. And this is why Allah says, وَمَنْ يُوْقَ شُحْحَ نَفْسِهِ Whoever is saved from his greed is the successful one. Greed is such. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gives the example of it in the hadith and he says, لَوْ كَانَ لِإِبْنِ وَآدَمَ وَادِيًا مِنْ ذَهَبِ If a human being will have one wali full of gold, he will say, I, would, I need one more. If I have only two wellies like this, full of gold, then I can do so much with it. And if he will have the second one, then he will say, I need only one more. And we will never be satisfied. Nothing will satisfy him except the dirt. Which means, dirt getting on him in his grave. In our hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man hu mani la yashba'an. There are two greedy people who are never satisfied. One is good, one is bad. Two greedy people, they are never satisfied. One of them is good, one of them is bad. Man hu min fud dunya la yashba'u minha. A person who has the greed for the worldly gain, he is never satisfied. He always needs more and more, looking for more and more. And woman whom alm, a person who has the greed of knowledge. He's a good one. He is never satisfied with knowledge, he wants to seek more and more and learn more and more. So we will have a greed for one of the two things. If we have it for dunya, we turn it and put it for the knowledge of deen, we will start getting that greedy for the knowledge of deen and that is good. So this Greed is really not a good thing to have, but Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us, a person who runs after the dunya 
will keep on getting into it more and more and will have, will keep on looking for more and more of it. And subhanAllah, it is so, it is such that at a time when you earn thousand dollars, you feel fifteen hundred dollars will be real good for me. And you start getting fifteen hundred, you say only two thousand will be good for me. After two thousand, these are not good. So if I get three thousand, then mashallah, I won't need anything more. After three thousand, still the person is not satisfied. And there is no amount that satisfies the person. The only thing that will satisfy the person is when the person will feel that Alhamdulillah, become grateful to Allah and say whatever Allah is giving me is more than what I deserve. That's it. Then, if a person doesn't have nothing except to survive on day-to-day basis, he is, he is the wealthiest person if he's satisfied with that. This is why once one of the scholars was offered a gift. So he asked the person who offered him a gift. He said, are you wealthy? I think it was Imam Nishirin, he asked him, are you wealthy or poor? He said, Alhamdulillah, I'm a wealthy person. I have a lot of wealth. And he mentioned how much he has in his savings. So he said, would you love to have the same amount, equal amount, more than what you have? He said, sure, if I get it, why not? He said, then you are still poor. I'm not going to accept your gift. You are still poor. The day you would think, I have so much, I don't know what to do with it. That's it, alhamdulillah, I don't need any more. This is enough for me. And I keep on working on day-to-day basis, that's it. I keep on getting every day, that's it, alhamdulillah. That's the day that when you will be wealthy. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us of this quality. So now these two ayahs talk about, two, first ayah talking about muhajirin, second ayah talking about Asfar. Let me quickly go through the third ayah also so that we can get the whole point at once. Those who came after them, now talking about us. Who out of the rest of the believers is good and acceptable by Allah, loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah says those who say, Ya Allah, forgive us and forgive those of our brothers who proceeded as in faith, who were believers before us, وَلَا تَجْعَلْ فِي قُلُوبِنَا غِلًّا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا And do not put any hatred in our hearts against the believers. So, one thing is, they make dua for themselves, they seek Allah's forgiveness, seeking istighfar for ourselves. Number two, seeking istighfar for the people that were believers before us, Muslims before us. And of course, the best the highest the quality of those were Sahaba Ridwan Allah Ali'in. And number three, third quality is they make dua that Ya Allah do not keep any hard feelings and hatred in our hearts against the other believers. It simply means they don't carry any hard feelings and hatred against others, against other Muslims. These are the people that are liked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the rest of the Ummah. Very quickly looking at these three qualities. The first one is istighfar, and we all know how important istighfar is. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in a hadith, Tuba liman wajala fi sahifatihi istighfar al kathira. Good news for those who will find a lot of istighfar in the record of their good deeds in akhirah. If there is a lot of istighfar, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, I'm giving you good news, then inshallah you'll do good over there on the day of Islam. Number two, the second quality, very important. Asking Allah's forgiveness for the people that were before us. Which means, we don't talk against the Muslims that were before us. How many people have this habit of talking against those scholars of Islam, those Imams, those even that Sahabi was like this, Billah, and trying to find faults of Sahaba Allah trying to find faults in the scholars of the Ummah that were in the past, trying to find faults in the muhaddithin, in the mufassirin, and using harsh words against them is totally against the iman and against the requirement of our faith. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith, before the day of judgment, a group of ummah will arise in this ummah, Qaddasul Asnan, they will be young people, Sufahaul Ahlam, and they will have no brain to use. يَقُولُونَ مِنْ قَوْلِ خَيْرِ الْبَرِيَّةِ They will always be using the word hadith. 
يقولون من قول خير البرية قول خير البرية means they will say literal meaning is they will always be saying the words of the best of the human beings which means they will always be writing a hadith and not only this يقرؤون القرآن they will recite Quran also but Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says I tell you لا يجاوز الترافيهم it will not even go past, to, uh, past their, uh, their necks none of it will be accepted from them Hadith is from Tirmidhi. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, one of the signs of the day of Tirmidhi, that لَعَنَ آخِرُ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ أَوَّلَهَا The people who would come at the end in this ummah, they will curse at the first, uh, the people who were at the beginning in the uh, portion of the ummah. Which means people would start talking against Sahaba Rizwanullah and Ismail, against Tabi'een, against Sabah Tabi'een. Aisha radiallahu anha says in a hadith, which is in Muslim. Urwa رضي الله عنه says that once Aisha رضي الله عنه said to me, أمروا أن يستغفروا لأصحاب النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. This is in Muslim. And who's saying this? Aisha رضي الله عنه at that time she's saying it. And we can see how much difference will be or how worse we would have the situation might be at this time. She says at that time that أمروا أن يستغفروا لأصحاب النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. People were asked to seek Allah's forgiveness for the Sahaba Rizwan of Allah Alameh Jumaeen for Sabbuhum, then they talk against them. And here we find people nowadays too. Very good. Who are totally against the Sahaba Rizwan of Allah Alameh Jumaeen. And there are other people who won't hesitate saying any word against the Sahaba Rizwan of Allah Alameh Jumaeen. Unfortunately, sometimes you hear from people, Sabbatul Afnan, same thing as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that these are the people who don't know what they're talking about, they're using the word Qur'an and Hadith, يَقُولُونَ مِنْ خَوْلِ قَوْلِ خَيْلِ الْبَرِيَةِ يَقْرَأُونَ الْقُرْآنِ They're using Qur'an and Hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us about these type of people, that these people, they don't care about what they say regarding Sahaba Ridwan Allah alayhi wa to that extent, sometimes nowadays, sometimes you hear it, you tell the person that you know Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu said this, Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhu said this, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said this. He says, yeah, yeah, he may not know what he was in, uh, about the other hadith. He didn't know about the hadith. He didn't know what he was doing. And these kind of statements about Sahaba Ridwan Allah and his reign that are very dangerous. Of course, it is possible on certain occasions, and it's some Sahabi, you know, some Hadith. But how about the other Sahaba? And there are certain issues where the Ummah agrees, all the Sahaba agrees on those issues. And we find nowadays people are trying to be more intelligent and more knowledgeable about Deen than all of those Sahaba, just like the first Adhan of Jummah. There are a lot of Masajids where they, are not, they stopped calling the first Adhan of Jummah. It's called at the time of Uthman radiallahu anhu, Aisha radiallahu anhu was still alive. It's called during the time of Ali radiallahu anhu, and all the Sahaba are agreeing to it. Throughout the times, all the Sahaba continued doing it. They immigrated to different countries, they continued doing it there also. All of them agreed to it. Just like Salat al They all performed it. And now we come up and we say no. They made something wrong. And it's bid'ah, it's haram. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't do it. This is what exactly this ayah is referring to. That we have to love for those people. And we have to seek to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That ya Allah do not keep any secret in our hearts for the believers. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in a hadith. Anas radiallahu anhu read the hadith. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ya Bunayn. Beautiful hadith. And inshallah I will end with this hadith. يا بني إن قدرت أن تصبح وتمسي وليس في قلبك غش لأحد فافعل. My son, if you can do this every morning and evening, look into your heart, make sure you don't carry any hard feelings and hatred against any Muslim. Do this every day, twice every day, every morning and evening. Clean your heart, look into your heart, and clean it if there is anything of that kind. The hadith continues, did not finish. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ya Bunay, wa dhalika min sunnati. Oh my son, this is my sunnah, my way of life. Simply means, 
I do this also. What does Sunnah mean? I do this also. That every morning and evening, I look into my heart to make sure I have no hard feelings against anyone. And my son, remember this, whoever loves me, he follows my Sunnah, and whoever follows my Sunnah, Allah loves him, and whoever loves Allah and Allah loves him, that person will go to Jannah. So, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us, that Number one, we respect those Muslims who were before us in the Ummah. Yes, we can say when if they have made a mistake, we can say that yes, this person made a mistake in a good way, that okay, he made this mistake in the translation of the Hadith, and the explanation of the Hadith, and the interpretation of the Hadith, or of the Ayah, but not cursing at those people, not just blaming them for not knowing anything, and for just saying anything. SubhanAllah, I just remembered once, talking to a person, and we were discussing something about a hadith, I said to him, Hafiz ibn Hajar rahimahullah, said, and he has written this in his explanation of Sahih al-Bukhari, that is called Fatf al-Bari, one of the best explanations of the hadith, by Hafiz ibn Hajar rahimahullah. So I said to him, Hafiz ibn Hajar has written this in his book Fatf al-Bari, he said to me, I wish I would not have that, heard that word in my life, he said to me, what did Hafiz ibn Hajar knew? What did he know? All he was doing, he was flipping pages, copying from here and there, and then putting it in his book, pressing it in his book. SubhanAllah. This statement about one of the greatest muhaddisin that was in the Ummah. Simply means that I know more than him. What did he know? I know more than him. And truly speaking, I will tell you my experience. Alhamdulillah, I deal with hadith, through the hadith, with the sciences, day and night. With all the technology that we have, with all the technology that we have to search for the ahadith, after searching for all the ahadith, from all the books, from all the softwares, from the internet everywhere about a topic, you go back, open Fatf al-Bari by Hafiz ibn Hajar rahimahullah. Go back, open Umdat al-Qari by Imam Aini rahimahullah. You would find that these scholars have mentioned more hadith than you found through all of your technology and everything that you have, but still they have quoted more hadith about that topic. And I have experienced that a lot of times. So, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking us in this ayah. We need to respect the people that were before us and not only respect them, even if we learn about any of their mistakes, we ask Allah's forgiveness for them. And, for the Muslims that are with us at this time, we need to keep our hearts clean from all of these Muslims, not carry any hatred against them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of these people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala love and give us the qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes to see in us. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولساء إلى المسلمين والمسلمات وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين